This podcast is sponsored by Kava and Arculus. Stay tuned for more information about both of them later in this episode. What's up, everybody? I'm Scott Melker, and this is the Wolf of All Streets podcast, where two times every single week we talk to your favorite personalities from the worlds of Bitcoin, finance, music, art, sports, politics, basically anyone with a good story to, te- to tell. Now, today's guest is a well-known economist and trader who's beloved by the crypto Twitter space and beyond. He has a knack for predicting what's happening in the future and putting crypto into the context of what's happening in global markets. I'm really excited to hear his thoughts on what's coming next. Alex Kruger, man, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Hi, Scott. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, uh, everyone, and uh, great to be here. Yeah, so, so listen, talk to me about dog coin madness. What do you make of the Doge, Shib, Flocky, et cetera, craze that we're seeing in the markets right now? I think we need to just accept that the market has um, uh, an appreciation for things, uh, for memes, basically. And uh, in a way, what we're seeing in, in, in dog coins and MIP coins is, um, how to put it is like they're like you could even say that they are honest coins because they don't really promise anything. It's just a meme. So if you want to buy it, great. If you don't want to buy it, don't buy it. Uh, I, I get and understand that people that come from traditional finance, they get uh, quite uh, triggered by the fact that the market is beating up these coins. And I understand it, but the world changed and uh, just have to accept it. And if you're a trader, trade it or watch. To, to me, the issue, obviously, I agree 100% with you. The issue comes when people, I guess, who are new to the market view it as an investment rather than a trade. I think that it's a trader's dream, to be quite frank, right? I mean, SHIB, Shiba Inu has had more volume than Bitcoin in certain times in the last few weeks. But there are people who really believe that these coins have genuine u- utility and will be around for another decade and that they're going to you know, retire on, on those investments. So what do you make of that? Well, to be honest, there's a lot of people that are retiring on those investments. So uh, in a way, I mean, I, mean I, I, I used to think the same way, exactly what you, what you just said, and I was wrong. I mean, I think uh, we are wrong. I think that actually if you get these, these coins at the early stage and are patient enough to actually, you have to get them early. Sheep right now, that's not an investment. That's a trade. You can put size on it. But uh, if you put a small amount of money on, on sheep a while ago, it's, it's, an, it's a known fact. That would be uh, would have been an extremely good investment, not necessarily a trade. The thing is, most of the people getting in are not really uh, that informed, and they just actually most people is interesting. They just buy without looking at the chart. Right. Of people course. just goes and clicks buy, and and that's an issue. Yeah, it is an issue, and the other issue is obviously that we tend to see uh, the coins go down as fast as they come up, and very few people sell near the top, right? I mean, it's human human yep. nature to ride the, ride it all the way back to the bottom. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. So, where do you think that that fix fits in context of the greater crypto market right now? You know, a lot of people who have been here a long time hate it. They say, you know, people should be focused on Bitcoin and Ethereum. Do you think it's a reflection of the crypto market in general? To the mainstream, or do you think that it's sort of its unique lane? No, I think it's uh, it's become mainstream by now. In a way, it's interesting. There's, there's quite a few things on this thing. One is that uh, much of it is an entirely different market than than actually uh, most most tokens. So we have basically uh, the tokens that we're talking about and trading the most, the yeah, the known ones with good names, etc. Uh, the meme coin category, I mean, it's mainstream by now because of adoption, but at the same time, it's, it's independent. It moves uh, on, the side, on, the, on the sides and it has uh, different uh, players, mostly. Uh, you could say the same with NFTs. I mean, if you look at right. NFT influencers and the overlap between uh, the different uh, um, areas, there's very little overlap between uh, dog coins, NFTs, and Bitcoin and uh, Solana, right? True. A lot of it, I think, has to do with the fact that the market has just matured and changed. You know, you sort of see people seeking this mythical alt season that seems to never come across the board like it used to in 2017. And then you point out last summer it was DeFi summer, then it was NFTs, then it was dog coins. There's always something that's tradable and going up in this market at this point. Yeah, 100%. I mean, for those who, who can actually, I mean, we, we actually been joking a lot about the rotator, right? But But the people that actually can rotate fast enough and, and change between narrative to narrative, which basically every week to three weeks, we have a new main narrative and that really drives flows. And at the end, it's about catching these flows and trying to get in somewhat early 
uh, and uh, if you get in actually you know halfway past the the in the second half of the narrative and hold um, quite likely going to get you know done absolutely so listen you have a great pin tweet i love and this is what it says bitcoin current macro drivers loss of faith in governments lower rates push speculators out the risk curve negative real interest rates inflation these are all interconnected the faces of a four-sided dice can you talk a bit more about that tweet I, I still believe it's 100% uh, accurate and, and basically what drives uh, Bitcoin and, and uh, as an extension, uh, crypto, um, because in a way, crypto is, uh, I mean, it's, it's changing and maturing at present, but uh, crypto is still basically most, most crypto assets are, are high beta Bitcoin assets. So you put a multiplier and in a way, it's like whatever drives Bitcoin drives the rest. Now we have the metaverse, et cetera. But going back to the Bitcoin thing, it's uh, the, the key component, I think, there is uh, interest rates, uh, which are um, the e real uh, interest rates, which are negative at present, which means basically that, uh, well, what that means is that cash is trash, as, as Ralio, uh, Ray Dalio likes to say. Cash actually, is a, that's a really good line he put out. Uh, it means that basically if you hold cash in your bank account or in uh, bonds or, in the, or any fixed income product, you're going to be actually be losing money. That happens because of high inflation or higher inflation and low nominal interest rates, which are the interest rates that we see in the market. And uh, adjusting nominals by uh, inflation, you get reals. And reals, when they're negative, is that make cash being trash. And uh, uh, the other thing that that does is basically at the same time, it pushes a great number of speculators out the risk curve to basically try to increase uh, their profitability or hit their return uh, uh, targets. Uh, all of this happening in an environment of massive liquidity uh, where everybody is awash with cash. And on top of that, we get the COVID impact of basically everybody getting really, really upset at governments because of what happened. Uh, either because of lockups, uh, I mean lockdowns or, or vaccines or or just getting done, you know, by by uh, governments uh, shutting down your business, your small businesses, while uh, you know uh, the uh, Amazons of the world they keep on operating and they take your uh, your market share and they they bankrupt you, and uh, people is not coming back to work. And um, in a way, I mean, we've been uh, privileged, uh, all of us in crypto, that we are at the peak of the. Uh, of this uh, wealth redistribution that is happening, where pretty much uh, everybody who is uh, middle class and not in, in not invested in the market, either crypto or stocks, uh, middle classes and everybody on, on on lower classes, they got destroyed by by COVID. And uh, right. the few on the other side, we we profited fortunately, and it's um, it's good for us, but it's really sad and people are pissed. And uh, Bitcoin, in a way, is it's an alternative, you know. Yeah, it is. It is good for us. But uh, in March 2020, not people, not many people thought it would be right. So I think, you know, crypto obviously crashed 10, 12 days before the, the yeah. stock market uh, bottomed. And there was a lot of this is dead sentiment. It's going away. I mean, even I, like, I you know, I, I didn't expect to do as well coming out of that as I did. I was a bit uh, surprised. But I think at that time, people didn't really see it recovering and 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 driving this hard coming out of that. So, I mean, are you at all surprised that, you know, it pulled a 17 X from the bottom while stock market doubled, or is that actually sort of uh, along your expectations of what you thought would potentially happen? It's, it's along my expectations on the Bitcoin side. What actually I did not expect was um, uh, the rest of the market to blow up the way it did. I mean, the, the other things going up hundred X and 200 X, Okay, that that I mean, I expected this thing and, and the uh, everything in the same direction, but not to this magnitude. And uh, that's where it actually comes into play something that I, I I go by when I trade or yeah when, when I go what I go by when I trade, which is basically try to unless trading short term where you want to have a really uh, ideally uh, well defined risk reward, um, do not put price targets. Special in crypto, you're going to get run over, you're going to sell, you're going to exit, you're going to turn around, you're going to say, fuck. And then you re-enter uh, 3x higher, you buy the top and you get dumped on and you end up with nothing. Yeah, I mean, the uh, FOMO trade is definitely the trade in crypto and very few people have the uh, 
have the, I think, discipline to exit and watch it continue ripping and, and not jump back in, right? But that, that's yep. sort of a rare talent. But there's also the other side, right? Uh, there's a lot of people who believe that you should or should not use stop losses. What are your opinion on that, the crypto space? I think it depends on the, uh, on the time frame you're, you're trading. Uh, if you're trading a short time frames, you need to have stop losses. Uh, if you're trading leverage, you must have stop losses. Uh, if you're trading a leverage, I, a liquid cryptos, you are insane and you are about to basically, or maybe not necessarily insane, maybe you're just uh, not well informed and uh, you're bound to basically lose it all. Um, I think for positional trading and uh, yeah, for, for positional trading, uh, one should not have any stop losses whatsoever. Uh, anything that is short term, yeah, you, you want to have well defined stops. Um, um, it's stop placement is, is an art, there's so many ways to do it, right? Uh, but uh, something I wanted to say there is that, uh, like, like when entering positions, like right now, when, when funding is getting a little bit hot, uh, I think one has to enter, if deploying fresh capital, use stops. If not deploying fresh capital, you're, but that's different because you're basically just re redistributing from uh, rotating from one to another, right? Yeah, uh, but that, fresh that capital in, in, in hot markets, yeah, you need those stops. So you mentioned obviously earlier that uh, interest rates and real negative rates were a huge part of the macro equation that's uh, forcing Bitcoin and the crypto market up. And I think the narrative across the board, or at least the fear, is the meetings coming up and the possibility of the Fed finally beginning to taper or rates rising. What do you make of that and, and its role? I guess, specifically for our audience, how that could affect the crypto market after the global market? Uh, I think is uh, mostly priced in. Um, I agree. Uh, there's two kind of things there when talking about something being priced in. We have basically pricing in around the event itself. So basically some things can run a little bit too hard or not, basically not being reflecting of uh, market expectations around that. And that can cause uh, very sharp corrections. And I think that is priced in. Uh, on the other side, uh, is, is the, uh, the longer term uh, impact on flows, right? Uh, like the, the, the example is the halving. So, so the halving itself, the event of the Bitcoin halving was priced in, but then you have the flows that actually you get half as many uh, minor rewards and basically minor flows gonna diminish continuously throughout time. So there's two kinds of things. Uh, one can be your price seed or not, the other one is real. So what I think is basically the Fed tapering, um, uh, the expectation, my expectation is it's going to be announced uh, tomorrow. And um, uh, this is going to be um, uh, basically to be implemented by uh, um, in, in a couple of weeks, goes through uh, uh, all through uh, June 2022. My view is that that's going to impact the slope of appreciation in financial markets but it doesn't really change the trend. And uh, one more thing I wanted to say is like, why do I think it's, it's priced in? Uh, well, first of all, we already had a very big correction uh, a month, uh, month five to four weeks ago. Uh, that was driven, uh, I think half of it was Evergrande, this uh, Chinese uh, uh, credit um, real estate company. And the other half was um, uh, tapering. Uh, so we already, we already went through the tapering motions. And then if you look at markets, for example, like, like what would make me concerned? If I were to be seeing, for example, uh, EM emerging market currencies selling off, I would be thinking, for example, okay, there is somebody here that knows, that's a highly correlated asset to the FOMC. Uh, somebody here knows something I don't know. I may wanna hedge into the event some. Now, uh, EMFX is not selling off at all. It's uh, actually quite stable. Price action across asset classes is rather stable. FX is stable. Uh, rates are right now rather stable. Um, uh, VIX is stable. Uh, the curve is flattening. The, the rates, uh, uh, the treasury uh, curve, curve is uh, flattening. Uh, something very interesting is happening there. Basically, for the first time, uh, the 30-year uh, rate um, is uh, lower than the 20. Uh, basically, we get a curved inversion in the long end. What does that tell you? It tells you that the market is not really that concerned on the long end about inflation. It's more like a shorter term thing. Do you believe that it's shorter term, that uh, inflation is transitory? Or I, I fully do. I fully 100% yeah. do. I think the, the long term effects on, on inflation of basically technology 
and in different ways, uh, technology advance advances impact uh, inflation are going to dominate entirely this. Um, I, mean, I was thinking six months from here, it may be two, hopefully six months and not two, but uh, it's a matter of timing. It will happen. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very positive on that, very confident. That, that's an interesting take and something that I've discussed with quite a few guests. The idea that no matter how much they print, you can't fight the deflationary pressures of technology and what's happening. So you eventually, I mean, they can literally just keep printing because they can't go hyperinflationary because of these other things. But what's the flip side of that, right? Eventually you print, you print, you print. You can't even uh, fight the deflation and then depression. Uh, you know, well, what, what um, do you think happens or do you think it stabilizes? We don't really know. That's the thing, you know, we have the case of Japan and Japan is still there, right? You know, aside of uh, the crisis that affected everybody else, Japan hasn't been special whatsoever in that case. I mean, they don't have a crisis. They just, they can't get out. It's an old, it's an old country. Um, uh, I think that the Fed in a way and all central banks have gotten into the place where from where they, they can't really get out, right? Uh, that's a fact. It's going to be like to, for them to get out of this, this new environment, that uh, this new paradigm, they would screw everything. Yeah, this, I think that's the, the thing. There's no way out. Just keep on printing forever. Sure, they'll keep on printing forever. But uh, assuming inflation is transitory, as you said, and that deflationary pressure is strong, then why do we need Bitcoin? Uh, we don't need Bitcoin. What we need is um, Bitcoin is useful. You don't really need it. I mean, we don't need anything, I think. Um, uh, at the same time, is um, uh, what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is an alternative. We don't really know that that's going to happen for sure. It's, right. it's uh, in a way, it's insurance. It's, uh, for those who care about that, you can see, even if you think it's not going to happen, uh, you can think of Bitcoin as insurance against the tail risk of governments and central banks losing control. It's like, a, um, uh, the, the way I like to put it, it's like a, it's like a put option without expiry on okay. central banks. So we, we are covered. Uh, that, that, that's a great analogy, actually. I uh, really like that. If inflation is not transitory, let's say that uh, the markets react negatively, which obviously is not what you're expecting, and we see some sort of correction or crash. Do you think that Bitcoin has done enough to prove that it's an uncorrelated asset, or do you think we see March 2020 again and we see you know Bitcoin sort of being a risk on asset, obviously it sells off and then potentially bounces, or do you think that it can kind of float on its own at this point? It's a great question. I don't think it can float on its own at all, unfortunately. Um, I would love it to be the case, but I, I don't think so. I think it's, uh, it's an asset that went from being uh, almost entirely uncorrelated to uh, slightly correlated through most of the time, becoming highly correlated at the times of stress. And uh, I think basically what happens is, is if inflation uh, gets out of control, um, that would mean that the Fed gets her, their hands forced to start hiking rates uh, aggressively. And if the Fed gets pushed to the point, uh, everything collapses, uh, including you... Bitcoin. Uh, it's, one, one last thing. So ideally, um, we could envision a scenario where actually Bitcoin collapses but after a very big drawdown, uh, it basically assumes a different form uh, because the market looks and, and goes and flocks towards Bitcoin as an inflation hedge. So basically put on a new, a new avatar on top. It's like, hey, this is my new me. Uh, I think it's very feasible uh, in that unlikely scenario, which I don't see happening. Yeah, I had a guest named Harry Dent, uh, who's sort of notorious for always calling major market crashes uh, an impending doom, uh, which he's been right, right about at times in the past. And he was sort of like notori notoriously not particularly a crypto enthusiast, but what he said basically was, if it all crashes, crypto goes the hardest and it's the first thing I buy. There you go. And, and, and that, that's, that's a thing. That's what makes the market. Uh, we make the market, people like us and people like him think in that way. And, and, and the more, then, then the, this view becomes uh, reality and uh, the narrative uh, becomes uh, reality basically. Guys, unless you've been living underneath a rock for the past few months, then you've definitely heard me talk about one of my favorite platforms, which is Kava. Kava connects the world's largest cryptocurrencies, ecosystems, and financial applications on DeFi's most trusted, scalable, and secure earning platform. They have borrow APYs as low as 0% and reward APYs as high as 200%. 
They let you mint stable coins, lend, borrow, earn, and swap safely and efficiently across the world's biggest crypto assets with a simple and intuitive user experience and the full confidence of institutional grade security and quality. Guys, if you have not checked out Kava yet, then what are you doing? You can check it out at the wolfofallstreets.link slash Kava. Do it now. Guys, I'm so excited to tell you about this new crypto cold storage solution called Arculus. Their cold storage technology keeps your crypto keys off the internet and on an Arculus key card. With no cables and no USB connections, it insulates you from the thousands of hacking attempts that happen online every single day. You can store, swap, and send your crypto all with a simple tap of your Arculus key card. And if someone were to get a hold of your card, it doesn't even matter because they have three factor authentication, ensuring that the only person with access to your crypto is you. Guys, you can check out Arculus at the wolfofallstreets.link slash Arculus. That's A-R-C-U-L-U-S. And they're offering $40 off if you use promo code Arculus40. Secure your assets, secure your future with Arculus. So let's assume that inflation is transitory. As you said, I, I kind of like what you said. Markets still continue to go up. They just don't go up as fast, right? I mean, effectively, yeah. is it flattens out, but they still continue to rise. So do we still see as much upside in, I guess we can talk about crypto as a whole separately, but in Bitcoin from here, you know, assuming those sort of scenarios, or have we really passed the point where the biggest, you know, percentage gains uh, have been seen in this asset? I think we are past that point. Uh, we're most definitely past that point. Uh, that doesn't mean that we are, um, that doesn't mean we're going down. We're just past that point. Right. Uh, I still think actually that, that crypto is going to continue to be uh, the best performing asset class uh, by a long stretch uh, on, a, on a basically uh, across timeframes, actually. So even, even that being the case, it's not an issue. Um, I do get worried when I see this basically all these uh, moon calls and uh, that, that basically drive people and, and usually drive people that are uninformed to, to buy tops, right? And uh, I, I hate to see that. So uh, buying tops, would you view buying Bitcoin now as buying a top? If I had nothing on, I would be buying Bitcoin now. Um, if I if I had nothing on right now, I would be putting basically twenty to thirty percent of my uh, crypto allocation and, and deploy it immediately. Like if you have decided to play this game and you have nothing on, you have a problem. And uh, it this thing may break out. And uh, yeah, it's a little bit hard, but we can run a lot on this on on this level on on these fumes. Uh, could be at 75, it could be at 85 uh, by year end. Uh, it's, it's very feasible. So you can't be flat. Our six figure targets hyperbolic, you know, by the end of the year or beginning of next quarter, do you think that that's stretching it too thin? People who call for seven figure Bitcoin, do you think that that's realistic? Or do you think that uh, that's moon boys, as you said? 100K by year end is possible. I think it's, it's very unlikely. Uh, or let's put it this way, it's unlikely. It's not very unlikely. I thought it was delusional uh, uh, in the event of basically uh, under normal circumstances, but these are not normal circumstances. We just had a slew of uh, ETFs approved and uh, that changed everything, I think. So uh, my base case scenario is more like 75, 85. Can we hit 100K uh, by year end? Definitely can. Uh, uh, 1 million Bitcoin, I think it will happen. Uh, most definitely, I have no idea when. I think we're, it's, it's way out there. Um, I also, it's, if, if you look at the people calling for 1 million Bitcoin, you, you quickly realize that they're always wrong. They're right in their view, but they're always wrong in their timing. No exceptions. Of course. Yeah. And, um, and does timing particularly matter if you're, I mean, listen, if you're looking for a million dollar Bitcoin, that's a retirement trade, right? I mean, that's an investment. You're not, you're not uh, disappointed if it doesn't happen next year. So isn't it just sort of absurd to put timeframes on targets that big? I, I don't like it either, honestly. I, I think it's actually absurd when you have no edge. Uh, but if you can, it's, it's very valuable because basically the faster you get to a, to, a, to a target, the harder the return. So it's not the same at 20% than at 99% a year. Uh, but yeah, yeah I, I try to stay away from targets. And, and most models, actually, they're more, mostly for uh, building the art and justifying views. Basically, if you're a hedge fund, if you're a VC, if you are or if you're a, a, an opinion maker, you need tools to basically say, this is why I think we're going to X or to the moon or whatever. And uh, models are extremely handy uh, when it comes to that. 
I guess the question really is uh, how much will a Big Mac cost when Bitcoin hits a million dollars? Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> what does a million mean in the world where Bitcoin yeah. is a million dollars, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Be very unimpressed with people who are millionaires probably by that point in the world and we'll only be talking about billionaires, right? So you brought up something uh, interesting that's been obviously a hot uh, topic of conversation on every podcast and everywhere on Twitter, obviously the ETF, right? So um, I think a lot of people wanted to see a physical Bitcoin ETF. Of course, we got a Bitcoin futures ETF and I've heard a wide spectrum of opinions on what that means, whether it's bullish or bearish, why it happened, why they accepted that structure. What are your sort of top end thoughts on the futures ETF? Uh, it is um, very bullish. Uh, undoubtedly, it's definitely bullish. It's not as bullish as um, pot ETF would have been uh, by a very large margin because it's not, it's not a good product because it suffers from uh, a, a basically a construction uh, Basically, the way it works, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be not too technical, but basically what this thing does is it has futures as underlying assets. So basically, X, say they, they get $100 with $100, they're going to get 100 in Bitcoin futures, uh, which on the other hand, by the way, on the other side, you get a market maker that is basically hedging the trade. So actually 100 Bitcoin spot do get bought along the chain at some point. So yeah, it, it impacts directly a uh, spot price. But and by the way, those like X percentage goes towards buying uh, uh, futures as you use it as margin. Uh, the margin is 40 to 50%. That means that basically your, your leverage, max, your max leverage on, on those futures is 2X, uh, which is way lower than the leverage yeah. you get on, uh, on non-US exchanges. And, uh, and then the other thing, what I wanted to say is that basically they're buying futures and futures are derivatives with an, uh, with an expiry. They expire every month, some every quarter, et cetera. Uh, Bitcoin futures expire every month. So they need to be rolled over around expiry, which means you are selling one future and you're buying the next. And because the, um, the Bitcoin um, futures curve is upwards sloping, basically, well, yeah, you get it. Uh, it's a, what is called a contango, where basically the further out the curve of futures you go, like the longer the expiry, the higher the future. So you are basically selling one future that costs X and buying another future that costs That's more expensive. Say right. you know a little bit more. So the the, the, the ETF is regularly buying uh, buying high and selling low, and that basically costs a negative carry uh, that should be around in the order of around 10, minus ten percent. Right. So again, can tango bleed basically? Right. Yeah. It's a dreadful thing. Yeah. And so that, that that's a great explanation of why the spot would be better. Uh, and wh what was interesting is that with the launch of ProShares, they had saw so much interest from the beginning that there were literally no futures contracts left to buy, right? And so yeah. uh, they had to start buying further out, which obviously detaches the price even further from spot. Uh, that sort of exactly. is a risk they probably did not have in mind when they launched, right? I mean, they thought that they would just be able to do end of the month contracts. And now you're talking about two, three months out. That's not a product that's gonna track spot, correct? Yeah, 100%, that's exactly the case. Yeah, and then I guess the other side of that that uh, is you know, sort of the institutional yield model, the, the BlockFi model, if you will, the cash and carry trade, of course, which you, know, you buy spot and short the future. Right, and you just sort of uh, gain on the as they converge. There's there's money to be made there. So how does that affect? Does that in any way do you think affect the price of spot? Obviously, people are buying it to short the future, but then they're selling futures contracts, right? Yeah. So the the, the delta in, the, the impact on on price there is actually uh, it's negligible uh, because they're exactly it, 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 they're being neutralized. But uh, what you do see is basically this uh, is exactly what you were saying is all these inflows coming into the futures markets. They steepen uh, the curve, the futures curve, which basically means that the implied interest rates in the market are way higher. And that basically basically goes uh, uh, goes across uh, Bitcoin markets and pushes interest rates across all Bitcoin markets higher. So in a way, people can be looking at, uh, at rates right now and uh, getting concerned that the market is too hot. Uh, it's, a little bit too, it's, a, it's a little bit hot, but it's not really as hot as people think because on one hand, rates now in this new environment are supposed to be a little bit higher, and uh, at least for now. And at the same time, 
the thing that I mentioned before, which is basically the fact that this uh, open interest uh, behind this ETF is not uh, is not as levered. And uh, but but like like finalizing the point that you were uh, uh, talking about is it's uh, this uh, brings a lot of opportunity for uh, uh, players in traditional finance to come in and capture that yield, and uh, it's going to generate massive amounts. It, it already is, but it's going to continue generating massive amounts of uh, smart money interest. Yeah, I mean, we saw we saw GBTC already. GBTC was trading at a twenty percent discount before the ETF launch, and immediately went to about twelve or eleven percent. Because I mean, if you can make that trade buying spot Bitcoin and selling the future, imagine what you can do when you can buy GBTC, which is at a twenty percent discount from spot, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a yeah, it's a good trade. I I, I still think it's a good trade, by the way. Yeah, of course. I, I I agree. Actually, I think that I actually think that the futures ETF made it a better trade than it was. I think it, it, it helped quite a bit. And then, of course, you see Barry Silver tweeting, "Hey, listen, we've approved a billion dollars to buy back more GPTC." Well, that's the reason, right? Because uh, they can yeah. make this trade and it's free money, billions of dollars a year. Yeah, the, uh, the the GPTC is actually a great example of a uh, of a case of uh, buy the rumor, sell the news. Uh, GPTC going down in anticipation significantly in I mean, in the spread. Uh, the discount going down in anticipation of uh, the ETF. As soon as ETF, ETF hits the market, goes down a little bit more, and then boom, off to the races up. Right. I mean, maybe I'm bearish, but it's my feeling that we got the futures ETF, and that's pretty much it for a very long time. You know, I know there's a lot of people who are looking. I know Van Eck this month is going to have their final decision on a physical ETF. GBTC is trying to convert to an ETF. I don't see any of that happening for a very long time. I think they basically threw us the bone that we were going to get. That's it. In fact, I would make the argument we're more likely to see an Ethereum futures ETF before a physical Bitcoin ETF. I concur, actually. There's, uh, there's a lot of uh, the market is not, there's no, no agreement there. Uh, I think we're basically one to two years out to a spot ETF, uh, but there's a lot of people, actually very smart money, that, that think that it's going to happen you know, in, in four to six months. Uh, right. That would be a game changer, by the way. Oh, that would be the game changer. And they, they're honestly, I mean, it's just my take from the outside. I would never bet against the people who actually have uh, inside knowledge of what's happening in this situation. Yeah. It would just surprise me because it seems like uh, the administration, Congress, uh, they don't have their have it together enough to actually even decide what committee they're going to put together to make this happen. It's more about just like... Uh, bureaucratic red tape, in my opinion, you know, to, to even get close to being able to, to look at this seriously. And I think the futures ETF was just very easy, but regulation, obviously, we, you know, has been sort of the other hot topic. We got the ETF, but we still don't have regulatory clarity on crypto. Certainly the president's working group on financial markets just released their report this week on stable coins. I don't know if you read it uh, or if you, if you t took the time to look at it, but actually I was, sort of surprised in a positive way at uh, their take on, on stable coins. Did you have a chance to look at that and have any thoughts? Uh, very briefly, all I know is basically the way I see it is one hurdle, one, one less thing to worry about. They didn't really deliver anything. They just said that basically they're gonna do what has to be done. The, on, on the good side is uh, that uh, also, they also push the can down the road. So there's nothing really happening right now. So we can worry about that again. It's like in a way, it's kind of like a, one of our debt ceilings, you know, this thing that happens uh, regularly and uh, we get all concerned about it, right? And then, ah, okay. I had sent the Senator Lummis on the show right before the debt ceiling vote. She, she joked about that. She was like, yeah, the hot topic right now is the debt ceiling, but we all know it's going to be approved. <laughs> We're all just yeah. negotiating and putting on a dog and pony show, acting like there's any risk that that, that wouldn't happen. But I, I found it very interesting that they put it in there that stable coins were effectively a superior, uh, you know, medium of exchange, they were faster, more efficient, that they saw mainstream adoption coming, whether they regulated or not. So to me, it seems like stable coins, they're just going to try to make them banks, right? If you want to issue a stable coin, you need to be a bank and it could be bad for Tether long term. I think Tether is just going to get a license eventually in the States and it's, it's going to be just fine. Uh, what happens is and at the same time is is stable coins are just a superior product. So uh, it's, it's unavoidable that all of fintech eventually ends up using stable coins and maybe issuing their own. And uh, at the same time, but this, the, the, the one big loser here is uh, uh, basically custodians, uh, unlicensed custodians. So this, this, it does generate, it will generate some, some ripples 
um, but I don't think it's a reason for uh, crushing crypto. It's no. just something that has to be done and generate some noise and, and changes the balance of power and, and it's fine. We move on. It's interesting what you said, because if, it, if, it's, if it's the unlicensed custodians that get hurt, that means the implication obviously is that banks become the custodians, right? And we were supposed to be shorting the bankers and longing Bitcoin, right? And then it seems like inevitably most of the Bitcoin is going to end up in a bank, just like your money. Yeah, but at the same time, I think most banks are are going to, are, are because of the crypto, um, they, at the end of this adoption cycle, they will have lost massive amounts of ground to uh, either other to fintechs or crypto companies. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we end the banks are part of the, uh, the end of being part of the system, but uh, at a, in, a, in a much, much uh, diminished, with a diminished footprint. I, I do think actually short bankers and, and long crypto uh, is, uh, still is uh, a good trade. Yeah, I agree. So what is DeFi's role in that? You know, a lot of people, obviously, the, I think the sort of crypto maximalists believe that DeFi can disrupt and uh, replace the world global financial system and, and every single part of it. And then I think there's people, myself, I think my, my view is that it becomes a parallel track and you sort of have a choice and people who are unbanked or underbanked obviously gravitate towards DeFi or a system that works better for them. But certainly the big banks still exist and you know most of the world's wealth is maintained there. I think DeFi is going to end up being mostly uh, um, what we call CDFI. So basically the... Uh the centralized platforms adopting uh, uh, DeFi technologies, uh, uh, money Legos, composability, um, transparency, uh, being able to audit things, uh, being able to execute things in, in one block. Uh, uh, there's a lot of innovation behind DeFi that goes way beyond the fact that it's permissionless. Uh, it's just great tech and uh, it's, it's inevitable. And uh, it is eating banks and it's going to continue happening, I think. So you see a world where DeFi can be the dominant financial system? Uh, not DeFi, CDFi, basically a combination. Right, a absolutely. Somewhere crossroads. They basically adopt the technology and present you a product that you're familiar with yeah. that looks like your bank. <laughs> I, I think proper DeFi is going to be like a, like a secondary crypto market, like, like a separate. It's a, I think there's a high uh, probability that basically the crypto market splits in two. Uh, a regulated one, an unregulated one. Uh, the unregulated is true DeFi and it moves on the sidelines like a gray market. It's hard. I'm not asking in any way, shape or form for a price prediction, prediction in, but what do you see then in five years, 10 years, right? Because I think a lot of people, we still believe we're very early. Certainly, I don't care what the price of Bitcoin will be, but what do you see the role of crypto? Do you see it eating the world in all these places? NFTs, DeFi, Metaverse. I mean, now we have so many different avenues, right? When I got yeah, into it, we I'm talked sure. about Bitcoin, right? We talked about Bitcoin being, whether well, it's a store of value, payments, where it was the endless argument about what Bitcoin was. That's almost become the smallest story in crypto, in my mind. I agree. Yeah, I agree. So uh, what, do you, you know, what do you think becomes... it looks like in, in 10 years? Uh, Bitcoin... Uh becomes uh, an asset uh, it could be bigger than gold in 10 years. I think Bitcoin's role is actually competing against gold. It's, it's the gold of, of the uh, younger generations. Um, uh, DeFi gets uh, adopted and um, basically it, 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 it ends up being like a hybrid between uh, uh, FinTech and, and DeFi and they become uh, synonyms. And um, NFTs, NFTs are gonna be absolutely everywhere. Uh, there are so many applications and uh, like, it's not just uh, characters and art, which by the way are great. I mean, even if we think they're worthless, um, we get uh, emotionally attached to things that have, a, have an image and, and they talk to us. So it's, we're less likely to dump them. And um, it's not just the art, it's, it's basically uh, uh, from tickets to uh, um, uh, miles programs, to uh, stocks, to real estate. Uh, I think there's so many applications and. Uh, I think actually the, the killer, the killer app in, in crypto is uh, NFTs. Uh, I agree. Incredibly, because you can tokenize uh, literally happy. everything. And and finally, metaverses. I think metaverses are are uh, one of the uh, the five uh, main uh, uh, topics uh, from an investing investing perspective, long term. And I think what uh, Zuck did, Zuckerberg, uh, with Facebook is uh, absolutely brilliant. And uh, something interesting there is this this talk in the market that basically 
Facebook and sorry, Facebook and and SAC made that change as a tactical move to basically take the attention of the marketplace away from all the scandals that Facebook is going through, such as the one around the uh, teenage girls and, and Instagram. And I think that's actually uh, coincidental or may have impacted the decision, the timing of the decision by a tiny margin, but it's really a very large strategic move. And uh, in a way, uh, what uh, SAC is trying to achieve is, is turning uh, uh, um, Facebook or Meta now uh, into the company behind uh, um, the, the, the company that in which the, uh, the, the, the metaverse in the movie uh, Ready Player One runs. Yeah. He's, he's trying to become that thing. That, that's the way I see it. And if, if uh, I mean, if the audience hasn't seen that movie, I mean, it's really fun. And I, I, I heavily recommend watching that movie to try to ambition uh, where we may end up being in, in right. you know, 20. Yeah. And my, my view has been that the metaverse isn't like this one parallel universe, right? It's each game is its own metaverse. Yeah, and exactly. sort of people have their own options. But saying that they have their own options, we just talked about how, you know, we have the banks, and DeFi, I see a world where we have like centralized metaverses like Facebook and then the decentralized metaverses and people have the choice, right? And, and, exactly. and which exactly one I think, you. and I, yeah. I think your people are generally gonna choose decentralized when when possible. But do you see that the, that sort of bipolarity in that space as well? Yeah, I, I, we, are, we, we think uh, exactly uh, along the similar lines. Yeah, uh, I think we're gonna see the same with uh, central banks central bank digital currencies, where uh, many of them are gonna be closed. So basically it would be the analogy between the uh, Chinese uh, CBDC that is closed and uh, Facebook's uh, metaverse, which uh, we can assume is gonna be heavily closed even though we're, they're talking about maybe inter interoperability as part of the narrative. Uh, and then we're gonna have all these metaverses that are entirely open or some that are partially open same with uh, CBDCs. We're going to have the closed ones, partially open ones, and fully open ones. Can you talk a bit more about that? Who do you think would have a fully open central bank digital currency? Obviously not China. <laughs> I think would be if, um, like a good candidate would be Scandinavian countries. Sure. Uh, Scandinavians are, are very progressive, uh, highly educated, uh, disciplined uh, um, people, and, um, and they innovate. So do you think that a digital dollar, United States central bank digital currency is somewhere in the middle or totally close? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. No, no, somewhere in the middle. So, because obviously I think one of the biggest arguments or fears about central bank digital currencies is the violation of privacy, right? I mean, we already see the U.S. government talking about, uh, you know, reporting transactions $600 and greater. Well, imagine if they have access to your digital wallet and, you know, control of the money supply. Do you think that that's, something that would drive people to crypto? Or do you think that it's something that could potentially, you know, a central bank digital currency could be a threat? Um, I think uh, both, actually. It's, it's a threat precisely because of uh, the desire of uh, governments to, to have control of, of digital currencies. We've seen that in China, actually, uh, this year already. Uh, and at the same time, uh, it, uh, CBDCs, they would act as both uh, a great uh, fiat on ramp, those that are the random blockchains that you could bridge between one and the other. And uh, at the same time, uh, the, the, the worry about uh, the states uh, abusing the power that actually a blockchain-based uh, currency would give them to snoop on our activities. I, I really think it's exactly as you said, I think uh, that would uh, drive a uh, heavy interest in, into crypto. At the very least, everyone would know how to use a digital wallet, right? <laughs> pretty, yeah. pretty good start in, yeah. in my opinion. So I, you, you mentioned that, uh, I think you said one of your, one of the five investments, Metaverse being one of them. So clearly you sort of have a hierarchy here of what you're looking at for the future and think people should be putting their money in. So what's your long-term view of how to get your money? What assets are you looking at that people need to have exposure to? I think you need to be exposed to Metaverses. You need to be exposed to, to crypto in general, Metaverses, which is not necessarily just crypto Metaverses. Also, right. well, now you have Facebook, uh, other ways to play Metaverses. On the uh, public equity side are uh, uh, basically uh, uh, stocks of uh, the companies that build these, these engines. So basically Unreal and Unity. Unreal is a, is a private company. Uh, I think it's gonna go public in about two years. Unity is uh, public. And then you have the, uh, the, the, the ones that make the hardware behind. So the likes of NVIDIA and uh, AMD, so the chip right. makers. 
So metaverses are, are crypto metaverses, um, CBDCs, which are not necessarily metaverses, and actually to get exposure to, to CBDCs at present is uh, very hard because there are, no, there are no public companies that offer you exposure to that theme. So the best way at present is actually having small positions in, uh, in layer one uh, blockchains. Uh, hoping that some of these are going to be working with uh, right. uh, nations government. and central yeah. banks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and layer ones are, you just, I, I love that you touched on that. I've been saying this for months every time I get on an interview or so. I just buy every layer one, right? I mean, that's that's been sort of my approach over the last year is like, I just want to have exposure to all of them because I don't believe anything kills Ethereum. I don't even think we need to talk about an Ethereum killer. I think each one can just find its lane and you can profit from that. And, and if, you know, two succeed and five die, the success is going to more than pay for what you lost on uh, investing in the others. Hundred percent. I mean, I wouldn't buy all of them, but uh, I think uh, buying uh, quite a quite a few, especially for for those who are not uh, living in like you know twenty four seven in the market. Right. Having a, a, a diversified basket with a reasonable weight, you know, they don't go too crazy on on on, on exposure. Uh, it's uh, definitely a winning ticket. Are there any that uh, you're particularly excited about and think could win that race? Uh, Solana. It seems like the yeah. obvious answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we all. Yeah, uh, it's not a it's not a non consensus trade anymore. Uh, to, but but still has, I think, uh, a lot of room in relative terms to uh, until it becomes uh, fully um, how to put it until its its outperformance um, goes away. It still has room to outperform, not the same way, but it still has room. And just looking at the the uh, market market cap rankings, and you see Cardano above Solana, it tells you everything you need to know. There's something wrong there. Is is the market is not efficient, and uh, yeah. on the long term, it 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 gets there. But Car Cardano's seen quite a quite a drop over the past few weeks. Do you think that that's a function of the market actually actually becoming rational? I mean, listen, I have nothing in the world against Cardano. I just never believed it should be the third coin by market cap when they haven't delivered anything fundamentally except for ideas. And maybe it will be the the greatest blockchain that was ever created. But do you think that we're just correcting from that? The higher they go, the farther they have to fall? Two, two things there. One is I, I do want to say, I'm sure you have a lot of people in the audience that are uh, Cardano uh, fans yeah, and, and sure. holders. And uh, I uh, definitely, uh, I respect very much the community. And I think it is a, is a good asset and what they, they achieved this incredible. Great. But at the same time, the tech is, is, is not uh, that um, good, to, to keep it simple. And uh, I see Cardano more like a like a meme, like a like a like a hybrid between a, a layer one and a meme coin, because most of the value is actually driven. It's like a meme coin. It's driven by the power of the community, which is actually, um, at least in the short term, is the most important thing. As you I say, that's that not community. really a negative. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, definitely. So it's and, and the power of uh, the founder and uh, his reach on, on YouTube is admirable. I mean, the guy is, is a machine. Uh, and I admire that. Uh, that that said, so on on the market, I mean, what had what happened is they had a botched uh, launch, right? Uh, their smart contracts uh, finally came out, and uh, uh, the narrative quick quickly catched caught on the fact that basically these things are not working well, and uh, it started tanking all the Cardano and and all the tokens in the the ecosystem. So uh, before we go, I know we're running out of time here. Is there anything else that you're really looking at, you know, as either a trader or investor that's, you know, what's really exciting you right now that we maybe haven't talked about? I think, no, I think we, we touched uh, most topics. I mean, things I'm right. excited about. I'm, I'm working in, in a lot of uh, projects at present, uh, which keep me uh, really busy and, and very excited, but it's not something uh, uh, we talk about. Not for public consumption. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure we'll find out uh, soon enough. Uh, I'm sure we'll find out soon enough. It's very exciting. Well, where can everybody uh, follow you and keep up with you after this conversation? Basically, just just Twitter. Uh, my 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 Twitter handle is uh, Kruger Macro, uh, like my last name and Macro from uh, Macroeconomics. Awesome. Well, listen, I've been uh, excited to have you on for a very long time. I know you don't do very many podcasts, so I very much uh, appreciate you taking the time to do this and all of your insight. And I hope that uh, everybody gets quite a bit out of this as I did. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.